This is the Animal Agenda. I'm Tom Keish, filling in for regular host Melody King. Our guest this week is Anthony Robles of the Animal Welfare Data Center. Whoa, that sounds dry. Speaking of dry, before we start, let's just disclose that while I volunteer for several animal shelter systems and rescue organizations, I'm speaking and asking questions as an individual in my own individual capacity. Hello, Anthony Robles. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me. Sure. Look, before we get going, I just want to say the first time I remember meeting you was at a rally uh, regarding animal-related issues, and you had such an interesting way of sharing kind of dry information that I thought, you're the perfect person to talk to on the radio because you make numbers come to life. So while you're kind of a number data cruncher, you tell a good story behind those numbers and you have a way of getting people involved and passionate about what you're passionate about. So thank you so much for being on the show. Definitely. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and, and to talk about all this stuff. Yeah. Um, even from that first meeting, all the information we've had since then has only grown 10 times by that. So I'm excited to share. And then from your Animal Welfare Data Center Instagram account, you wrote the AWDC was established to conduct research and gather data on legislation and laws, saving you time so you can continue rescuing. So what is the point or function or goal of the AWDC? I'm really glad that you asked that. Uh, one of our primary objectives as an organization is our, our whole goal is we want to create tools, techniques, methods for everybody to be able to pursue their own animal advocacy. What we've learned through all this research, because it started with, you know, real, real focused insights onto what's happening at this shelter, what numbers exist at this shelter. And as we started going through that path, we realized there's just so much more involved that people can do, whether you're rescuing on the ground at shelters, if you're at home on your computer, if you're good with numbers, if you're not good with numbers. And so our organization decided we're going to build tools, like literally applications, software applications. We're going to develop like guides, documents, research documents that we want to publish to the public. So that way, everybody, whether your concern is in one section of animal welfare or another section of animal welfare, you have a clear outline and a, a trusted toolbox of things that have been vetted and confirmed about our animal welfare crisis and the animal welfare community and all the networks that kind of work together that we may not see on a day to day, all those other big organizations that are doing important work, we're bringing all of that together into small, easy to access tools. I get it. And who's involved with the animal welfare data center? Yeah, actually half of us. So we, it's all a, a family organization when we first started um, between myself and my wife, we're both, uh, we both had our own rescue dogs before we met each other. And we were both involved in this, uh, you know, environment in one way or another. And so we make up half of our board and the other half of our board is made up of um, others where between all of us, 50% of us have professional experience in human health care. The other half of us have been experienced working with animals. My experience happens to be with both. Uh, so our team together is a combination of professionals that work in uh, process improvement, project management and development solutions. And also with people that directly volunteer with animals, rescue, do transports, work with uh, shelters directly. So that combination of work experience really combines for a more broad uh, scope. Excellent. And um, let's let's put a human face on the radio. Sure. So briefly tell me about or tell us about you, maybe where you're from, why data or why numbers? And um, why animals? And is there actually a center? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I've been developing applications and software with computers since I was a little kid. I've always been in love with technology. And so that's where it started. Uh, but when I graduated high school and went into my career for the first time, that was in human health care. And I got certified in project management. And the reason why that's important is because it's all about process improvement and understanding how processes work. I did that eight years ago, and that kind of kicked off my experience in how do we make processes better and combine that with my career in IT that I also started eight years ago. The last eight years has been spent working directly with healthcare organizations and state-funded programs, government programs that set like compliance regulations and standards. 
my job for the last almost a decade now has been understanding what those rules are, coming up with solutions on how to meet them, and then literally designing and building like the applications and technology that you know transports the organization to that compliant place. Um, so that's where I have come from. And because of that, I've understood there's such a huge need for data on a business side. I mean, even for me to get a project approved, a, one idea approved, there needs to be so much evidence behind it. And that has always come from data and realizing if that's where it starts with regular businesses and organizations that are for profit and just trying to make the world go around, there's no reason why we shouldn't be following that same kind of process for our municipal facilities that are supposed to be providing instead of monetary, just public impact. Makes sense to me. So um, as I mentioned at the top, I volunteer with dogs and I've somehow gotten involved with dogs and somehow I become like the dog guy. And mm -hmm. I've never thought I would be that ever. So how many years ago would you have looked at you now and been like, how did I get here? I had no idea. <laughs> that I'd be so passionate about something and, and be an advocate for something like this. So is this a surprise to you or, or has it been like a dream all along? It's, it's definitely half of a surprise because I've been, um, I've had rescue dogs my whole life by accident, meaning that I saved them and that's how they came into my life. And my, um, my last dog was a pug. His name is Darth. And he came to me in the middle of the night he, I didn't know at the time, I believe was being used for breeding. And so me getting him off the street, taking care of him, I had like this connection with him and with animals that I understood was bigger than most people, but I didn't understand what or why or what it was about. And when I met my wife, uh, she was more directly involved with seeing rescue stuff. And so when I got involved just to try to help, I wanted to see what was going on from my professional experience, seeing how much was lacking and how many gaps there are in just there's so many people that want to do more to help animals that genuinely, they just need help. And the shelters, it's not their fault. The people out there that are trying to do their job in those specific scenarios, it may not always be their fault. How do people help? And realizing that that was super hard, I wanted to get involved. So that leads me into my next question, actually. And that is, how do people help? And before you answer, let me be more specific. So I make a living as an actor, a writer, a singer, a producer. I've I've filmed, I do photography. I enjoy that stuff. And somehow that's led to what I do for animals now with my Instagram, posting dogs, telling their stories, getting them out there. You had this data knowledge, this technology knowledge, this passion for that stuff and animals, and you combine them and now you're helping animals. So besides people who are photographers or videographers or storytellers or dog handlers or dog trainers or dog massage therapists or groomers or whatever, who are, they can see like, oh, I know how I can help. Uh, I, or I love walking. I could be a dog walker or, or cat petter or what, whatever you have it. How can people help if they don't know how they can help? Is that a question that you would like to answer? Yeah, absolutely. I would like to answer that because it's that's kind of what is driving all of our work is figuring out, okay, how do we employ people? How do we, meaning uh, how do we help people engage in the stuff that they want to help with? And what that comes down to is the way I think most people can help, and I know this sounds kind of broad, but I'll get to a point, is that we have to all be speaking the same message. Right now, the biggest issue is that if we think about this in a smaller setting, if we had a retail store that was really crazy one day and we had it all out of control and the next day we all came together, the same group of people and said, hey, how do we deal with today you know, better than we dealt with yesterday? It would take us all kind of sitting together, coming up with an idea and putting that all into place, right? And when you're not talking about a retail store and you're talking about public administration with multiple counties, cities, the part that's important is Everybody from all over the place has to have the same kind of path. And this path has to lead back to who can help change the policies. And that's always going to come down to city elected officials and legislators. So if you're a photographer, videographer, or you're a storyteller, or you have this special kind of skill, I would say, how could you use that skill to highlight a specific issue about animal welfare that concerns you or that impacts your community? 
And then after you've highlighted it, how can you find some evidence of that happening in the kind of documentation that's already made available to you by the public? I know that sounds complicated, but what I mean is we're basically trying to shine light on issues that are already there. And the people that have to make these decisions, they have no idea that those problems are there. They don't see it as often as you. How can you help package that really easily so when you get that 10 seconds in the elevator with someone that can sign that, yes, we should change this tomorrow, how do you clearly show them, here's what I'm really concerned about, here's proof of where you could see it in our community, I would like to ask for your collaboration to help my community. And that's the key part, is that contact should be to local representatives in your area. And that we now have links to on our, on our profile. We've provided this awesome resource by um, USA.gov that type in your address, zip code, it'll tell you who your city elected official is that you should be contacting about your concerns. And then it's kind of how do you put that pretty package together and deliver it to that person. And that package can be done any way you feel. You're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. I'm guest host Tom Keish, and I'm speaking with Anthony Roblos. And we're talking about data and animals. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. You just stepped into the elevator. <laughs> and right behind you is either a mayor of your town or a board of supervisor person who's in charge of your county or a shelter supervisor. The doors just closed. You have 10 seconds before they get off on the next floor. Go. Animal welfare is a much bigger problem than inside the shelter or outside the shelter. It's a problem that's happening for everybody. We would like to collaborate with you to figure out what problems you're having and how we can request support from legislators that can make those changes to the community for your organization to try Bing. and address this problem. Bing and the door opens. So now they get in on the next day you're there and you get another 10 seconds. Now, this time, what's one number, since we're talking data, that you could give them that you think would make an impact? That's it's actually, it, that is a tough one because to be honest with you, I have the answer and the secret sauce is that there is no number and that's the problem. It's when it comes to unaccounted for animals in the population that's impacting the shelters. And at that point, did you know that shelters are almost 90% always over capacity? That overcapacity never goes down, which means that in a whole year, less than 5% of the time, a shelter is actually operating at the capacity it's supposed to. So we have to control how many animals are coming into those shelters to help control that capacity. And that begins with regulating how many animals are getting out into the population, which is, you know, we could talk about that if you'd like. I don't want to pull yeah, into that. And, but and we are going breeding. into that. We're definitely diving into that. Yeah. So... Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Spay and neuter, I'm assuming. Education, I'm assuming. Keeping animals at homes, I'm assuming. Um, what else? What, what, what would you like the public who may be listening to this or is mm -hmm. listening to this, what would you like them to know? Yeah, there's, there's a few parts of this, of this goal that we all have that's very challenging. And one thing that I would encourage everybody to try to put into practice on your own as you're, as you're following this advocacy is try to remember that everyone has different opinions, different views, and different perspectives. The best way to connect with people and to agree with people and align on solutions is to communicate and present to them productively, proactively. And I'm starting that way because what we're going to be talking about are topics that everybody has different opinions on. Everybody disagrees about what should and should not happen when it comes to how do we impact overcrowding. And so starting with that, I would say spay and neuter is ultimately at the very top of the list. That's a priority. If you're not involved with animal welfares and rescues, it's things like communicating to your family and to your friends and to people around you, your colleagues, the importance of spay and neuter, the importance of keeping animals at home. I think there's this really bad um, stigma. It's like a normal part of, of society to feel like animals are just animals. They're just pets. They don't have emotions. There's, there's nothing connected to them. Who cares? And you'd be surprised how often it makes a difference 
if you're the one person at a table with five other people and everybody makes a you know very uncomfortable comment for you to say, no, it's actually really important to keep your dogs at home. It's actually really important to get your animals spayed and neutered because it impacts the community in a lot of different ways. Taking the time to, to help educate others around you makes a big difference. That's number one. On the other side of that coin is where we do need help from legislators. This is out of everybody's hands, everybody. If you had the perfect plan and you took that perfect plan to a shelter supervisor tomorrow and you said, this will work, and they said, okay, we still would not be able to do anything about uncontrolled breeding and overpopulation without the help of legislators. And that's because there has to be regulations around that whole process because there just isn't today. That we would have to break down a little bit more as to, okay, how can an individual person get involved in that? Because that breaks down into a few layers. But the spay and neuter is a big one, whether it's the shelter helping push that education or the community helping to emphasize the importance of that, or on the other side of that, just, uh, getting breeding under control. Perfect. So you know what legislators are. I know what legislators are. Other people know what legislators are, but not everybody knows when you say legislators what that means. Mm -hmm. So who should people talk to if they're involved with, let's say, Los Angeles City? Who should they talk to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a big believer in starting from the bottom up because it shows that you have done the steps that you were supposed to take. So when I say this, apply it to your, your own position. Where are you in this ladder of steps? But it would start with, you do want to make that first contact with shelter supervisors, right? Like if they're running the shelter, you want to make that communication and ask them, what challenges are you faced with today? What are your challenges, the shelter? Not approach them with, here's what my problems are with what you're doing, but what challenges are you faced with? Find that out. And now by finding that out, you're basically offering collaboration. If you tell me what's challenging you, I would like to offer the community's collaboration in reaching out to our city officials. And those city elected officials are basically people that, yeah, every time we come to elections, everybody votes on these people that make decisions for their city. Those people aren't just making decisions for their city as to, you know, what color are we going to paint the curbs and what color the mailbox is going to be. Those people are also deciding what requests go up to the next layer of government which is the individuals that are literally changing the laws. If your city, you know, operates a certain way and there's a need in that city because maybe everybody in the city is, is suffering from some environmental impact from some new process that's going on. The whole city finds that important. Your city elected official finds that important. They write a request to these quote unquote legislators or these individuals at the next layer of government. And they tell them we need new laws to help get this problem under control. And then those individuals, there's a whole panel and that's when everybody has here heard the word Congress, this whole big group of people get all of these requests and start reviewing them and deciding what goes and what doesn't. Convincing those people what goes and what doesn't, that's the part that we're talking about. That's the true work that all of us are doing and none of us really know that. And you're saying that anybody, any citizen can do this. Absolutely. That Absolutely. they have the power to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and write mm -hmm. a note and express their concerns. Definitely. It starts with just, I think, remembering, reminding your community and the people around you that we as the public hold so much more power than I think we realize. And all of that starts with communicating what we need because our, our government officials, everybody, they're supposed to be there to provide us safety and service. So we met at a rally and I think the second time and third time we met was also at a rally. Mm -hmm. And at rallies, there are plenty of people who are outraged or complaining or screaming. But I think the thing that I enjoyed about you and I think that you appreciate in me is that we both understand that that sort of pushes back people who can make the changes. It sort of gives them a opportunity to label crazy or irrational, or you don't know what you're talking about. 
And it seems that what we connected most about over the time we've known each other is that we appreciate the solution and the the possibility of answers um, and not just putting forth the complaint, but sh- identifying what the issue might be and then offering solutions. Would, would you agree with that? I completely agree with that. I think it's important for individuals to remember that it takes more than good intentions to, to make change. It takes a lot more than having a positive hope to see things into action. And what I mean by that is if you feel like this is really important, I really need to scream this to the clouds because these animals deserve better. You're not wrong. And I give all of these people a lot of credit for taking time out of their day, making an effort, putting themselves out there to go try to do that work. What we're trying to do is give guidance now. Like, great, I'm glad that we have all that passion and energy. Let's focus it in a way that is we know is productive in, in a sense that we have literally seen and heard from these individuals and gotten feedback from them where they tell us it scares us. It scares us. So we don't respond. And so now we want to tell everybody let's respond different. This is the animal agenda. I'm Tom Keish filling in for Melody King. My guest today is Anthony Robles and we're discussing things, legislative and animals. So we're going along here and we're getting towards the end. And there's so much more I want to talk to you about. Um, People can look you up at your Instagram, your website, and stuff like that. And we'll give that information out later. But what do you see as the biggest issue regarding animals in shelters in California? I think we already touched on this, but I just want to give you a chance to just punch it one more time. Yeah, and I think, forgive me for like walking around it, but... I think that's the part that's hard is that it's no longer the one problem in an animal shelter. We're realizing through all of our research, it is a primary issue in the animal welfare community. The animal welfare environment is mindset, mindset and mentality. If the mindset and mentality is wrong outside of the shelter, it's going to be wrong inside of the shelter. If we're not doing enough training and education for people, they're going to work at the shelters. Once they get inside, that environment is going to be very, very difficult to handle and how they handle it is it's, it's going to be impulsive. On the other side of that, if we talk about vet care and sanitation, the same thing, those policies and procedures, they don't exist. But the problem is that the mindset around those policies and procedures is that they're not needed. So I think the most important thing that we're really hitting here is understanding that this is no longer a fight. The shelters need to stop seeing this as a fight between advocates and the shelters And advocates need to stop seeing it as a fight between shelters and the advocates. This is a problem we are all in together, and we have to start collaborating because whether you like that or not, we can't move forward without it. I say all the time, it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the networkers, and it's just not the volunteers and the networkers. And, you know, it's, it's literally everybody is on the same team. And one thing we have talked about off the air is that it, it affects people who aren't even concerned about the shelters. It It's a communal issue. It's a societal issue. And the overcrowding in a shelter influences what's happening outside the shelters. Because if animals are overcrowded in the shelters, there may be bacteria or diseases happening there that then go out to the community. So mm-hmm. everything affects everything we're all interconnected would you agree with that i completely agree with that yeah and that's why i would emphasize when we say it's a society problem when i say it's a society problem i don't mean society as in public i mean society as in humans like it's a human and animal problem we are all trying to fix this problem for our animals excellent i i couldn't agree more so um Wrapping up, what is one number, what is one thing that when you talk to someone who's not really involved with animal welfare or advocacy, what is that one number that people are shocked by, surprised by? Um, I, If I'm being very honest answering the question, even though it's something that I think a lot of the animal welfare community is is familiar with. The fact of the matter is the number, the total percent of animals that get euthanized in shelters, which at in California is nearly 50%, is that's a huge number. 
And when you think about that, it's like when we say in shelters in California, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of animals. And when you say that over hundreds of thousands of animals, half of those facilities are being cleared out. And in combination with the average length of stay, I don't know if everybody's uh, familiar with this, but in, in writings and texts and laws, animals are supposed to have 14 days in a shelter. On average, animals are getting four days in the shelter before they get euthanized. And let me be specific, that's just with data that we have available to us. This is an ongoing research. We're gonna get this more and more often. But the fact that they spend so little time and there's such high numbers shows there's no chance. Totally get it. Anthony, I wanna thank you for being the guest on the Animal Agenda. I think you've been excellent. And if somebody wants to know more about you and about how to help your mission, how should they reach out to you and where can they find that information? Definitely first check our Instagram at Animal Welfare Data Center for a lot of daily updates. Our website is being turned into a resource library that will be stocked full of documents, tools, techniques, everything for the public. It's going to be a growth in progress. So just be patient, but check in on that website. And you can always email us at info at animalwelfaredatacenter.org if you wanted to get in touch with us. The website is animalwelfaredatacenter.org. We could literally talk for hours, you and I, and we have yeah. talked for hours in the past, <laughs> and we are just touching many different subjects. But I thank you so much for being on the program. I hope to have you back, and maybe Melody King will interview you at some point. But please keep in touch and keep doing the good work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. I'd be happy to be back and talk anytime. I continue the work that you're doing too, Tom. I appreciate it. And Melody, thank you for having us. This is Tom Keish, your guest host. And you've been listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. My guest has been Anthony Robles. And we've been discussing all kinds of things related to data and animals. We hope to have him back on soon. Special thanks to our producer, Marlena Bond. Please support listener-sponsored KPFK by donating online at kpfk.org or by calling 818-985-5735. Once again, get your pen out. That is 818-985-KPFK. We really, really appreciate it and cannot do this show without you.